Go. All right, I hit record. Go, take it away. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We're uh, doing our part three of our Tech Talk series, and today we've got uh, Carol Song from Purdue University and Jack Smith from Marshall University that are going to uh, give us an overview of the GABS project. Uh, it's the geospatial software building blocks powering science gateways. So this is, uh, I think, a long-running project that, that uh, Carol and and Jack and a number of others have been working on for a number of, of well, quite some time. And uh, we'll uh, get a quick uh, lead in and, and get started on the project. So I uh, hope everybody is uh, in for the next hour and look for questions. Uh, Carol, do you want to do care, uh, questions along or just towards the end? Uh, if it's quick questions, I don't mind answering them along the way. Okay. And so I'll definitely be put... available after the, the talk. Uh, okay. To hang That'd around. Be great. So, so you can raise your hand or you can uh, put the uh, questions in the chat box and we'll keep an eye out for them. And with that, Carol, I'm going to go ahead and hand over to you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Well, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, Jeff and Marisa uh, have given me to uh, talk about our geospatial data building blocks uh, project. And uh, so a few words about myself, and I'll let Jack to chime in as well. Um, so my name is Carol Song. I'm a senior research scientist at Purdue and part of the research computing organization. Uh, GAPS is one of my projects, and I've been also on um, projects like TerraGrid, Exceed for the past, I don't know, 12 years. Uh, and it's been fun and, and we hope to uh, be able to work with a lot of um, people from different domains. Jack, do you want to say a few words by yourself? Sure. Uh, as most of you know, I wear multiple hats, but for this particular uh, instance, I'll be a, a Marshall person, since that's actually uh, who I'm representing on this project as well. Uh, I actually got started uh, working with the folks at Purdue, uh, the my my GeoHub and the WaterHub people on an Exceed um, Campus Champions Fellowship a couple of years ago. And that's sort of how I got to know more about what was going on up there. Uh, after that project, um, I actually went to the Gateways Conference uh, that year, the first one for the SGI, SCCI Institute, uh, and actually found out about their uh, extended developer service program. So. Uh, that got me even more tied into the Gateways community. Uh, even went to the Gateways boot camp uh, to help get our particular Hub Zero portal off the ground. So uh, the, as time went along, it became very clear that uh, there was some synergy between what we were trying to do at Marshall, what they're doing at uh, Purdue, especially around uh, Hub Zero uh, in the water quality world or for us. So when uh, the CSSI solicitation came out, uh, Carol had invited me to participate as potential co-PI, and, and that's kind of how we end up where we are today, uh, trying to put together a, a framework that will allow us, uh, as a self-hosted side of Hub Zero, to kind of work with the, uh, the folks at Purdue in producing a framework that's broad, broader use, especially for uh, water quality in our case. So. Uh, that's about it for now. Okay, um, thanks Jack. Uh, I'll also mention that there are a couple of people from Purdue on this call. Um, I can't see the list right now, but um, they can also help uh, answer questions if needed. Um, let me move forward, get my slides going. Okay, so, um, so um, here's what I'd like to do today. Um, I'll give an overview of GAPS, uh, the project, and uh, mention a few things about my GeoHub, and we'll also spend a little time talk about the next phase of GAPS, which is the new project uh, Jack mentioned, under, funded under the CSSI. Uh, and I'll also provide information for people who are interested in learning more about uh, what we produced. Um, let's see, so what is GAPS? Um, Essentially, I want to talk about how GAPS, the project came about. So, you know, um, in the last, I don't know, 10 years, we've been working with a lot of uh, different um, scientists from different domains and deal with data. And data really looks like, you know, different from um, different applications and from different groups. Some 
um, deal with you know these um, humongous repository of uh, data files. In this particular case, they're NetCDF files, but they're buried into you know gazillion folders and. Uh, usually, it's challenging for people to navigate, find them, download, and after you um, massage it a little while, you forgot where you got and what you got, so get really confused. And obviously, um, in the geospatial data world, we deal with um, you know raster data, vector data, um, point data, uh, time series included. So all these different kinds of data. And the problem is only getting worse, right? Uh, in some sense, um, it's geospatial data is everywhere now. Everybody's generating these data, um, especially you know these initial open data initiatives uh, embraced by cities, putting um, data online and publicly available. Um, and you know major data organizations like USGS, they're putting a lot of data, large amount of data online. And also, um, for modelers, they generate humongous amount of data. We have one researcher at Purdue who, whose data alone um, takes up one third of our archive storage right now. And, uh, and more and more, uh, we've found people who are collecting data from the field, from you know, other sources. You could call them crowdsourcing or um, um, just all kinds of devices, like uh, array of things. Um, they're all uh, collecting data points throughout the uh, um, either city or fields uh, with lots of different variables. So these are the, the reality, and it's only you know, the amount of data, the complexity of the data, um, a pervasiveness, it's just getting worse, right? So. From the user perspective, um, we're talking about uh, researchers, grad students, um, undergrads even. Um, they have, they, they, most of them don't have deep data expertise or geospatial data expertise in particular, but they have these needs. For example, uh, one person may have data, but uh, another person uh, also wants to use the data set, but maybe extracting certain variables for certain regions, uh, or um, people who create models, they, um, they want to make it available, make it more transparent, so other people can test the model with their own data from their own region, and we're actually involved in um, several projects that um, this is the case. And also, um, when people use other people's data, it's becoming uh, um, more and more a common practice to, to be able to cite the data. Now, how do I set, cite a data set um, that somebody else produced? So all these are issues that um, um, affects the day-to-day -day activities of uh, the research community. Um, so um, dealing with geospatial data is really not trivial. Um, obviously, we have people, um, some graduate students can um, set up their own system, figure out all these open source or commercial software and connect them together to work for their problem. But in general, uh, there are so many choices as I put here, put up here, not all of them, not. Um, very comprehensive, but the common things that we run into. So essentially, it comes down, you know, choices and how these apply to your particular problem. So out of our um, work developing custom systems, custom applications, um, we um, came up the idea that we really should create um, reusable um, software modules that deals with data, uh, geospatial data, and make it really easy for people to manage and share geospatial data, and help them create tools that that's GIS enabled, without everybody having to um, have deep expertise in GIS software. So that was the main goal. And um, some um, overriding principles that we thought of at the time when we conceived the project. So it needs to be open, accessible, and usable. And uh, you need to make it um, self-service so people 
don't have to go through sys admins or, or acquire special privilege to to create these tools or to use um, online resources for sharing geospatial data. And, and you can read the, the list. So these are the guiding principles to our project. And fortunately, we were funded by an NSF uh, data infrastructure building blocks program uh, in which some of the projects um, uh, provide hardware or, or um, comprehensive cyber infrastructure resources. Uh, our project is more uh, producing reusable software, we call uh, building block software. And the project was officially funded for four years, started uh, 2013, and we uh, got a supplement for another year and uh, we're kind of at the end of the project right now. And so the main components from these projects, basically um, uh, four areas. One is that um, to create an integrated data collaboration environment with built-in geospatial data support. So um, it, it'll be, I'll show some uh, screenshots uh, what it looks like. So basically you don't need to install anything and just use it. And also uh, viewers and, and, and builders that require no programming to visualize geospatial data. The third group of things we did was to produce libraries or toolkits for people to quickly create applications that has GIS capabilities um, without you know, um, expert training in uh, creating GIS applications. And the fourth area, um, which is also very important is to be able to, uh, for our software to be able to interoperate with standards and other platforms. And um, we definitely wouldn't start from the scratch. So what we did was to leverage uh, Hub Zero. So uh, maybe many of you have um, already uh, heard about Hub Zero or even used in Jack's case, he embraced Hub Zero a long time ago. Um, so essentially, it's a uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Hub Zero. Essentially, it's a open software stack that helps people create dynamic websites for scientific collaborations. And started with a Nano Hub and for for online simulation. So in that domain, uh, very often they have these equations they need to solve and then they produce a um, something that can be visualized. In, in this slide, the example is a, um, probably a nanotube structure or something that people want to um, interact with, rotate, slice, you know, uh, interrogate the values uh, at certain points. So things like this, uh, after a while, um, people feel that really it's not really that special for uh, nanotechnology. It can be, this framework can be used for other science. And so um, there came Hub Zero, which means you know, you, you, when you set it up, it's a blank kind of web portal, but all the um, bells and whistles are already built in. You just need to put in your own content, create your own tools and so on. And uh, right now, Hub Zero um, is supporting more than 60 science gateways that we know of. And it's operated by professional staff at Purdue. And um, these portals or hubs, as we call them, are generally 24 by seven, uh, which is very handy when we um, do training, do outreach and, and all these types of events. Um, so, uh, Hub Zero, um, I'm not going to go through every detail, but just using this picture to show that on the right side, you can see that, you know, it's the um, normal, you know, your uh, web server, but there's also this architecture for uh, scalability. So you can add execution hosts, which um, where the uh, um, tool containers run on. So these are lightweight uh, virtualized containers where um, when you start a tool on the website, the tool actually runs in a container. And these can be scaled up by adding more hosts if you have uh, a lot of people using the tools at the same time. And so this slide really shows you um, a little bit more in depth uh, how the uh, 
the tool session in your web browser, go through the web server, and through the middleware, which is a big part of the Hub Zero software stack, um, it launches the tool on a tool container. Um, so you can have multiple of these virtual containers running on one server. And for special visualization needs, uh, it actually goes to a render server um, to, to provide the 3D rendering. And also, um, you can see the, the submit proxy can interact um, with uh, all kinds of uh, cyber infrastructure, HPC, Open Science Grid, and other uh, cloud resources as well. So all of that hides the details of interactions with these resources from the, the tool developer. So they don't need to know how exactly to uh, interrogate the HPC system or QF jobs. They just say submit this work to a system, essentially um, as simple as that. So based on this Hub Zero architecture, what we needed to do in the GAPS project is to really add the parts that deals with geospatial data. So here you can see that uh, we leverage a lot of open source software like GeoServer, PostGIS, Solar for searching, and IRAs providing the storage, uh, underlying uh, logical storage. And we um, also added toolkits uh, on the right side, um, top right, uh, the what we call building blocks, which includes a, a map library and um, uh, this thing called uh, Rapture, which stands for Rapid Application Tool Development um, that came from the original Hub Zero software stack. We extended that to include uh, GIS capabilities. So um, this is kind of a high level picture that shows um, the parts that we have to add to um, Hub Zero to make um, gaps work. Um, also, I call the attention that on the left hand side, there's a block uh, labeled data service API. So that's providing third party applications to directly interact with the data stored in uh, gaps enabled portals. So essentially this platform gave us all the capabilities needed starting from creating a project, managing your team, share data, uh, track metadata, uh, let other people browse and search for data, and viewing data, obviously geospatial data support and also allow people to create and use um, geospatial enabled tools and essentially publish both uh, data and tools. So this whole um, uh, framework uh, with all these uh, functionalities um, all on one platform. So um, that was the goal and uh, that's what uh, happened. And through this uh, development, we engaged multiple um, research domains, um, as I showing on this slide, and um, most of them um, are researchers who don't have um, GIS expertise. Okay, so um, from GAPS, as I um, listed earlier, these are sort of our deliverables. And so uh, in the next section, I'm going to go through some of these uh, in a little bit more specific details. Um, and then um, I'll sh also show where the resources are. So for data management and sharing and publication environment, uh, these are some screenshots of, uh, I, I can do it online, but it takes probably more time to, for me to find these things. Um, so um, essentially, um, this is showing the collaboration space. So user collaborates on what, what's called in Hub Zero a project. So you create a project where you can share data and other information. And um, you can see that, so this is kind of an interface, uh, very similar to a file explorer except it's in a web portal, it's in your browser. And the storage is um, provided by, um, managed by IRADS. 
in the um, so there are um, the a number of metadata items are automatically extracted from the data files um, of certain types, right? If it's um, structured data like in that CDF, uh, GeoTIFF, things like that, um, those metadata would be automatically extracted and populated. And user can go in and actually add more data if they choose to. Our experience has shown that, you know, if it's not automatic, people just don't do it. So you often get these data sets that just have, you know, uh, very um, few items of uh, metadata. So with this um, automated uh, extraction, um, so most of the geospatial data file, fortunately, they're uh, very structured, they're very metadata rich. So all of that can be um, shown and, and be used by people. And also the, um, uh, the viewing capability, that's all built in. So uh, just to view shape files and, and overlaying raster on top of it, for example, um, you don't need to um, build your own infrastructure. You don't need to have your own server. It's just in there. So basically, this is like a, a file explorer that understands geospatial data. So this slide is kind of busy. Um, um, the couple of things I want to call out. One, um, as I mentioned, there is a data API. So uh, if you have an uh, application that's not on Hub Zero, it's also possible to uh, for that application to interact with the data storage uh, in the uh, GAPS enabled Science Gateway. Uh, for data transfer, we do support HTTP, and for large data, there is a SFTP mechanism for you to um, get the data in your science gateway. And um, so on the left-hand side, um, this shows that um, you, know, you could have mobile applications. This is one that we created both um, uh, used for a specific application and also as an example for people to, when they create their own mobile apps, they can take this as an example and modify. So this allows um, uh, people to grab, uh, collect data in, the, in, in whatever environment you're in using your iPhone or, or Android phone and capturing you know, all kinds of data, sound, uh, video, images, and, and so on. And uh, on the right-hand side, it's an actual application that we're working on to, um, so uh, some researchers developed these um, uh, plant sensors that can, that's very uh, sophisticated, for example, with multi-spectral cameras, not your RGB cameras. Uh, these cameras can give you a lot more information than RGB. And so what they do is they scan the leaf of a plant and, and then end up with lots of data and they can, um, through a mobile device, they, th this type of data can be sent to um, the sci uh, GAPS Science Gateway um, immediately and um, depending on you, how your app uh, in the portal uh, is displaying the data. In our case, uh, we actually show data as they're being collected. So it's real time. So if a farmer takes measurements, um, that data would pop up right away. Um, let's see. So um, perhaps um, I'll run through this um, example of a workflow to give you some idea. Um, when we say workflow, all on, one line in one place, what that means. So um, essentially, so a user can upload a file um, into the data management space and um, they can view the metadata, view the, the uh, geospatial map itself and verify that that is the right data. Uh, we find this feature um, being used very often. Um, and from that, um, so, um, from the upper left corner, uh, you can see on each file, you can actually um, click on the open with uh, button 
that shows you the, the appropriate applications that can be applied to this file. So when you open, in this case, it's uh, a general purpose tool, uh, image processing tool called Multispec. It opens up and automatically load the data into the tool. And in this particular example, we're taking a, a region, uh, just crop the, uh, the image file, it, um, just focus on a, the African re region, and then save it, save the results as a new file. And this new file goes back to your collaboration space. So uh, that in turn can be uh, searched uh, by other people, and also this file can be used. You can see it's a, now it's a, just um, South Africa, and this file can be used to um, by other people for whatever um, applications they need to um, uh, study. And uh, the last step in this workflow is that um, you can publish your data set. And um, in this case, um, the uh, gateway automatically assign a DOI for citation. So this is all uh, automated. You don't leave this uh, web browser. Um, instead of uh, um, what the current practice is, you know, people have to do a lot of downloading, uploading, and using different kinds of tools or scripts, homegrown scripts, and to, to accomplish uh, these tasks. Okay, so let's see. So a uh, little bit uh, about the, a uh, little bit more detail about a published data set. So this is an example of a real published data set. Um, you can uh, document it, put screenshots, and uh, you notice that there is the uh, DOI that's um, automatically uh, assigned. And also um, it helps you um, track the total views or downloads and which comes real handy. Okay, so um, there's so much to talk about um, how GAPS can help people develop tools uh, quickly, but I'm just gonna run through one example just to give you a sense of what it may look like. Um, so one point is that, you know, in this, um, graph, you, um, on the horizontal uh, direction, uh, you have the effort of uh, programming, so um, more to the right, the effort is higher. And then the richness of the interface um, is on the uh, y-axis. So essentially, if you want uh, ultimate um, flexibility, obviously, you can create a, a native web component in Hub Zero or using some um, type of web application um, creation tool. And um, then, you know, uh, most of the researchers uh, that we work with uh, sort of stay uh, in the lower, lower left corner. Uh, so Rapture gives you a very quick way of creating a, a web app, but not much flexibility. And we've created uh, this Python map library that gives you, um, you know, the basic uh, map navigation capabilities, zooming in, out, um, uh, moving the map around, putting on layers, um, interrogating values, and things like that. Um, and also, um, Jupyter and RShiny, um, these in, uh, interactive environments um, have been integrated into Hub Zero, so you can there you can create um, your own tools with more um, flexibility. Um, so um, out of gaps, we also have um, data viewers and tools um, that don't need any programming that can help you uh, sort of configure your data set to be uh, to show an interactive uh, interface and share that with other users. So um, there are three ways for creating geospatial data visualization uh, out of gaps. One is the in in extended Rapture toolkit, and then the Python map library. And also, like I said, in these IDEs, you can um, uh, create whatever apps you want um, using existing uh, libraries and uh, then publish as a 
Hub Zero web application. Um, so for this one, I'm going to run through an example using the Python library. Uh, so you have a concrete idea how that might be done. And, um, and just show a few examples of um, the, the IDEs. So um, this, uh, I won't go through the slides. You can read later. Uh, so the Python map library is really um, abstraction of how you would create a map enabled uh, user interface in your scientific tools. And so um, it's, so the example I'm gonna use is um, a weather data explorer example. Uh, the data came from uh, weather simulations. It's a lot of data and it has a um, variety of different variables all related to winter weather because we're in Indiana, so we deal with snow. And the um, state government, um, the uh, Department of Transportation, they need to plan for, for example, salt uh, and trucks, scheduled trucks and things like that. So they really want to uh, look at um, the, uh, the um, they partner with the Purdue um, atmospheric uh, researchers to, to uh, do modeling and um, to help them with decisions. And so in this situation, uh, in this application, the Python map library provides the map widget, like uh, um, the area in the outline. You can see on the right hand side, there is a number of controls. Those are all built in. So to do this, um, you don't really need to um, be an expert with GIS programming. So what you do is using the Python map library API. So this um, library is built on standard libraries, um, QGIS, PyQt, GDAL, blah, blah. And so from a user perspective, what you do is in your Python code is actually very high level. You can say, once you say create a map container, so you see the frame there. Um, oh, when you add the widgets, I think. And then you can uh, grab a base layer and display it. So in this case, um, I think it's uh, open street map base layer. And you can add shape files in there and it's a matter of just um, naming it. And a lot of these options, if you don't set, there, is, there are defaults available, so you don't really need to go into the details if you don't want to. Um, and then um, the last step is putting the actual data. So this data uh, in particular comes from a database um, that we manage, um, or, or when the researchers create it, uh, the uh, uh, simulation output, um, they stored those into a database. So um, there's your uh, complete application with all the controls and navigation. And in this particular application, um, the user can um, pull up, you know, based on whatever dates they're interested in, uh, then they load all the data in there and either play it uh, as a video or um, go through it image by image and uh, look at the uh, specific areas. And they can also load up a different shape files. Um, the Indiana Department of Transportation, they divide the state into uh, regions for management. So you can look at a particular region. Um, so a few words about um, just an example of uh, what you can do with Jupyter running in the hub. So this is just your normal Jupyter environment. You can um, use it in training, in teaching. Uh, we see more and more of that. And the good thing about running it inside a hub is that um, there is a process for you to kind of wrap this up into a package and then um, essentially pushing a few buttons, then they become a web application where people cannot change your code, but they can use it. Um, so this is one example that um, we worked on. Um, another popular environment is RStudio. Um, 
we support uh, our studio, our markdown, um, Shiny. So these are things that a lot of our researchers are already using, they're used to, they're doing it on their laptop. Uh, by moving things into um, this environment, they, they essentially just um, migrate their code in here and, and then they have the ability to make it a web application to share with people, to cite it in their paper, to uh, use it in training and teaching um, in particular. So how do you um, access gaps? if you are interested in. So the first option, um, we have this MyGeoHub gateway. Uh, we, it, it's free to access. Uh, we do host projects, as you can see that there are major projects we're hosting and um, they uh, were hosting at a cost. And there's all, um, also every uh, new release we um, get from GAPS, we put it on this um, gateway as a showcase, also uh, supporting our researchers. And um, GAPS is also uh, part of Hub Zero release. Um, there are packages available and you can install if you want to do it on your own machine. And there is a um, Amazon um, setup that you can do. We actually have a video that shows you how to install it with one click and uh, under 40 minutes then you have a GAPS enabled science gateway. Okay, so um, just a few words about my GeoHub. So it's, it's an instance of Hub Zero plus GAPS packages. Um, it um, specially supporting geospatial data and software applications but you don't have to. So people often ask me, so it would, I don't um, exactly have geospatial data, so can I use it? Um, yes, the, the answer is yes. Um, targeted audience. Targeted audience, so uh, obviously domain researchers as end users, also as contributors, and also application developers, and uh, students, training participants, and we also have um, uh, engagement effort with um, agency staff and just uh, general public. So it really depends on the kind of tools available. Uh, we do have project that engages, for example, uh, ex university extensions and, and in turn engage farmers, for example. Um, so two things I want to mention is that uh, our this science gateway is different from most science gateways in that that uh, we host multiple projects using Hub Zero Supergroup. Uh, what does Supergroup provide us? Um, it it provides each group with a uh, custom group page, so you can brand your um, do your own branding. Um, you can manage your own contents, obviously, and also um, uh, because all these groups are sharing the, the um, software stack and hardware, um, they each can um, have the ability to push software uh, separately so that you don't interfere with each other. For people who are familiar with web development, that's a, that's a, um, a pretty big deal. And also they, uh, the groups share um, hardware, software, um, and most importantly, cost of maintenance. So it lowers the cost of Hub Zero hosting. And another important feature is that uh, the, their project will be, still be alive when uh, the funding drops. So we all deal with that, right? So you have a project that's funded for three years and then you go off funding. So what do you do? Uh, you still want your work to be available, to be accessible until you um, are funded again for example. So uh, this is our, um, our um, features. Um, so there are a lot of applications um, on my GeoHub and I want to be, let's see, I like to show just one, uh, just give you a sense that, um, so you see something for real. Um, 
So this is a, a late, one of the latest applications we um, help a group develop. So it's, um, it's an economic model uh, of agriculture prices, land use, and the environment. And it's been used to study issues in uh, fuse systems, interactions, and in food uh, sustainability type of issues. So uh, what this tool does is, um, uh, so for every tool, I'll show it, that you have a resource page where you can put a lot of information, including um, the screenshots. And so when you start the tool, uh, you can see that it allows you to run experiments. I won't run it right now. And then you can also look at the experiments you have run. So this is a list. Um, and also look at the experiments other people have run and made it available. So for example, if I go into a um, somebody's um, simulation results, I can actually look at all kinds of um, things that, um, that um, the data can um, show. So if I zoom into the area, I can see how um, the output of this um, results. And obviously, if you're doing this research, you'll be able to talk about you know, what this data means. And um, to look at the data values. And so all these, the point is that all these um, uh, features and support, you don't have to actually um, program it yourself. So it comes from the library. You, once you create it, and it's there. Um, all these are default. Um, so that's um, just a quick demo. Let me go back to, um, let's see. So uh, I'm going to skip these. A few words about uh, interoperability. Uh, so we work with different other projects to um, either make the data available or make the tools available from my GeoHub that other cyber infrastructure can use. For example, from HydroShare, you can launch a tool that actually runs on my GeoHub. And Sarah, we're not getting anything via uh, web share right now. Do you have anything up on your desktop? What was that? I, uh, we're not getting a feed of any kind right now. We just have black screen right now. Are you, are you sharing anything on your desktop? Oh, okay. Let me see. Let me redo it. There you go. Okay, so I was in the presentation mode. Do you there see you. it now? Looks good. Okay, okay. So I just want to call out a few projects that we, um, we've we done interoperability work. Uh, HydroShare, BrownDoc, we're using BrownDoc services to parse certain data files and we're working with uh, HydroShare to actually, uh, for, for HydroShare resources to launch um, tools on my GeoHub. So those are uh, work in progress. Um, some of them have been released already. Um, okay, so enough about what we have done. Um, going forward, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this new project, just a very brief overview, and then I'll ask Jack Smith to talk about, uh, since he's part of the project, talk about his particular use case, uh, how that uh, could benefit from something like this. So um, the vision, so as a next step, now we have sort of a foundational layer that we provide in the Science Gateway to deal with uh, geospatial data. The next step, um, we want to help people connect to remote data sources directly from their computational tools. Right now, the way people uh, getting uh, make use of remote data sets typically is that they somehow get at the data they need. So that through a um, combination of scripting, web access, downloads, you know, some massaging, and all of that, before they can feed the data into their computational model or, or application. So what we're going to do is to uh, make all of that easier, making them more seamlessly connected. And uh, the, the 
ultimate goal is really to um, put these easy to use tools uh, into the hands of researchers and students and um, to support this um, principle called FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable for your data and your software. And so to do that, um, we're um, again very excited that we're funded, just recently funded by the NSF CSSI program uh, for five years. And so um, it's a partnership between Purdue and Marshall uh, and we also have uh, a number of partnerships, including data providers, cyber infrastructure leaders, and software developers, and industry and federal government and state government um, groups. And so there are four very specific objectives. One is to develop this plug and play data framework, and then use this framework to uh, address domain science needs. And obviously, we're going to um, uh, work on interoperability and also make sure that um, this is usable by the broader community. And as in any NSF projects, everything has to be driven by science. So we do have a number of uh, use cases uh, included in this project. Um, I listed them here. And the last one is Jack's project. Um, and just a very high level view. So this framework um, that we call GeoEDF, uh, Extensible Geospatial Data Framework, uh, includes several key components. One is reusable data connectors. So these are connectors that help people get data from remote data sets. On the top, you can see we've identified a number of data sources already. And as the pro, uh, project proceeds, we'll probably um, um, connect with more data source. And for example, um, in a recent workshop uh, at the um, Array of Things project, and you know we were able to talk to them, and it sounds like um, that is something that a lot of people want to use, and that would be a, a really great um, target to shoot for to create data connectors. And the second group is uh, what we call data processors. So this includes a lot of things that help you make data usable in your computational tools. And also we're gonna um, help you already include uh, tools for courses, for, for teaching and learning, and we're gonna uh, um, enhance some of those, make them more usable, and then the fourth group is really the uh, creating data services to interfaces that can make uh, that would make um, interoperability uh, achievable. And so on the bottom, you can see these are existing technologies that we're going to build on. So these, um, including gaps, we're going to uh, use that uh, still and also a lot of the open source um, software packages and um, HPC resources and, and other tools. Okay, so I think this is where um, Jack takes over. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you, Jack. All right, very good. Um, we got just a few minutes here, so let me just quickly go over the use case that we'll be involved in at Marshall. Uh, we actually have an existing HubZero portal called Aquabeat, which supports two different EPSCoR projects, uh, both working with water quality uh, issues, uh, a lot of watershed modeling, a lot of uh, field sampling, et cetera. Uh, what you see here on this slide is actually a shrunken down version of a poster uh, that was presented not too long ago showing sort of the components and the roadmap for, for our particular portal. Uh, and you can even see things like some of the newer things like Jupyter Notebooks, et cetera, that are just starting to come out from uh, that framework. Uh, we are a self-hosted uh, HubZero site, unlike most, uh, hosted at Marshall. Uh, and we are actually running sort of the older platform based on Debian rather than Red Hat. So uh, 
We're a little bit behind of being able to implement all the things that you just saw with GABS. We have parts of it, but not all of it implemented. Uh, but we do a lot of geospatial uh, modeling, so we're anxious to be able to uh, leverage that as it comes out. So we'll be both a test bed uh, in terms of a, a self-hosted site that has to roll their own, uh, as well as a particular discipline uh, devoted to uh, water quality data collection and modeling. Uh, one of the pieces that I've pulled out here is the part that interfaces with the water quality portal. Sorry. I'm sorry. Where to sorry. Go? There you so go. do you want the next slide? No, right there, to the right there, you'll see I just sort of pulled out that little, little section so we can see it. Uh, that is our proposed interface with the water quality portal that the USGS and EPA uh, provide. Uh, it's a publicly accessible source for water quality data. Uh, and what we intend to do as one part of our project is to implement uh, that interchange with the water quality portal using the GeoEDF framework. Uh, so actually Marshall's role will come in about a year into the project once a good part of the framework is there and also once parts of it have been ported over to Debian uh, so we'll be able to make use of it. So uh, this is all still in the future. Uh, trying to get this uh, connector done to the water quality portal uh, has been a moving target for us. Uh, EPA has changed the way you get data into their portal over the last couple of years. Uh, they've now actually migrated to actually having a REST API uh, to their web portal. Uh, so things are actually getting easier uh, for us. And so about the time we actually do this, it shouldn't be that hard to build a, a real connector. Uh, currently, you have to go through building your own virtual node and go through this uh, elaborate exchange process. Uh, so hopefully that will get uh, easier as we move along. So go to the next slide. Uh, so our goal is to essentially build on, you know, the existing GAPS framework once it's uh, portable to Debian. Uh, and of course, the GOED framework as it evolves with all those other features that you saw for data sharing and, and whatnot. Uh, it will be developed, uh, we'll be doing our work on our self-hosted portal on Aquavit at Marshall. Uh, the first two things we'll be doing probably in, in this year, I'll be building the importers for both the batch data in terms of CSV files and real-time streaming data through an API. And we'll be building all that framework in advance. In fact, part of that's already done. Uh, the biggest step for us will be to convert the data as it comes in in various formats to a format that's compatible with the water quality exchange. Uh, and there are tools to help you do that on their particular web portal, but we'll need to migrate a lot of that uh, in, inside our portal. Uh, so that's kind of where we are on that. And that was actually a project that we tried to do with the Science Gateway Community Institute as an extended developer support application to do that. Uh, but they kept moving the target on us, so we kind of backed off. And we still have that on our plate for this year. Uh, as I mentioned, the EPA is now going fast forward to a, uh, a REST API. And I'm in the process right now of testing that. Uh, so hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll actually have a, a first prototype of being able to push data out to the water quality portal uh, from the HubZero framework. Uh, of course, once it's out there on the portal, uh, then you can use their web services to pull that data back. Uh, so you'll have the full cycle, be able to push data out and bring it back and be able to merge that data together for local analysis. Um, forget the next slide, would you? Uh, so one of the issues I've had to deal with here, which I didn't really expect, was people don't like to share their data. <laughs> uh, so one of the things we're gonna be working on is a way to stage the data locally until they're ready to publish, uh, push it out to the water quality portal. So part of our challenge will be to uh, collect the data from both uh, local storage and from the water quality portal into sort of a cohesive package that they can do their modeling and publications with and then uh, as that's done, push it back out to the public. Uh, so that's something we're working on in-house right now is to figure out just how to segregate those two uh, and merge them and, uh, uh, as needed. Uh, so essentially, Aquavit will become uh, a conduit between uh, the public data sets uh, that are out there and not just the water quality portal, but other things that are coming along as well. Uh, 
and the uh, the user um, basically sitting there with Jupyter Notebook or some other visualization tool and uh, having access to his local data as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so another piece of our uh, uh, our, our end of the project will be to develop specific templates and workflows for working with water quality data, in particular modeling tools. And so we'll probably be uh, focusing on some Jupyter Notebooks uh, as tools uh, and also some R uh, based applications. And we're actually working with some of those right now, with our Jupyter Notebook uh, uh, that we have now have in our hub. So this, and the researchers are actually finally getting interested in doing something uh, on Aquavit as opposed to using the Linux workspace. So uh, that's exciting. And I think people will be ready uh, for the advanced capabilities that uh, GABS2, as we're calling it, uh, will provide. Especially when we can start making it easier to share that data outside uh, to make it discoverable and publishable and, you know, and whatnot. So interfacing with HydraShare and the other uh, large uh, data stores, that, that would be a big plus for us. So that's pretty much in a nutshell. And I think we're right on time. Okay. Well, um, I'll just wrap it up. Um, so one, one thing I'd like to point out is uh, as uh, Jack works on his uh, end of things and he'll create, he'll figure out things, right? So he'll figure out how to interface with these data places, um, EPA protocols and all that. So uh, all of that experience will eventually, um, I'm hoping result in you know, data connectors that can be shared with other people. So essentially we plan to have a mechanism for people to find these data connectors and to be able to um, grab data connectors and processors and, and um, stitch them into workflows for, for their computational needs. Um, so I guess these are the acknowledgements of grants that have funded this work and uh, a few links. And um, definitely I'll be happy to um, answer questions via email uh, or other ways. You can always find me through Marisa or Jeff. And that's it. So we've got some uh, time for questions. I'd certainly like to thank uh, Carol and Jack for, for presenting this. I, as we got into the actual applications of the, the project, it, it uh, seemed like there were a lot of uh, options and, and a lot of customizing uh, capabilities for the, the effort. Uh, I was particularly excited to see Jupyter Notebooks and RStudio in the integrated into GABS as that uh, really kind of stimulates and, and supports reproducible science. So. I think those are really uh, neat components of the, the whole thing. Uh, I think Carol and maybe Jack have time. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, but we can certainly take some questions so long as Jack and Carol have time to uh, answer them. Yeah, definitely. I'm here. Anyone? So, Carol, are you planning on uh, having a presentation at SC for this, or have you applied to uh, present this work at uh, PERC-19? Uh, well, PERC-19 is so far away, right? <laughs> it's, it's a ways out, but we realize how quickly it uh, approaches. Yeah, so uh, we haven't talked about it, but definitely uh, I'm going to do some presentations for our booth. Uh, I don't know. We haven't probably done any advertising yet we should um, uh, yeah um, and uh, we're also um, I really like to for this group to um, to see if they're interested in participating in future workshops so we do have a, a stakeholder workshops planned for next year probably around September October time frame to sort of share with the community what we are doing and make sure we're on the right track and hearing what people need. And like I said earlier, we start already with a set of requirements and, and we know um, some groups what they need, but we um, once we go a little bit further, we, we would be ready to go out to the broader community and get more input on um, directions. 
So I guess uh, in addition to your email, uh, uh, looking up looking you up at uh, supercomputing would be a uh, at the Purdue booth. I guess would be a good time to for some of the attendees to talk about uh, questions or, or projects they might envision for Gabs. Yeah, definitely. I'll be happy to chat with anyone who are interested. And Carol, um, we do have a question in the chat box. It's from Ming um, for Hub Zero. In Hub Zero server implementation, which operating system is preferred, Windows or Linux, and is there any requirement for hardware such as how much RAM is needed? Um, so it is um, Linux. Um, is Rajesh still online? Okay, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Can you answer that? I, I'm trying to, I'm struggling with my uh, Zoom interface. I can't find people. Yeah, so, uh, so it's so the packages are available only for Linux. Um, Red Hat is usually preferred Red Hat or CentOS, uh, but as Jack mentioned, we do have uh, Debian implementations as well. Uh, the resource requirements they sort of depend on what you want to do with the gateway itself. So there's actually uh, VMs that you can just run on your host machine. So you can just use VMware or VirtualBox to actually run a Hub Zero VM if you just want to. Um, uh, sort of play around with it, but then if you want a production setup, then um, and then depending on the number of tool sessions you want to support, uh, that sort of uh, scales up the the resource requirements that you might need. But then a a very simple like four gig um, RAM machine should be capable of just running like basic Hub Zero and Gabs as well without, and maybe a couple of tool sessions. And Rajesh, I guess downloading the, the VM is a good way to try it before you buy it in a sense. There's no cost. I'm not implying that, but uh, just to, to get a feel for setting it up and, and tinkering with the parameters and things, the VM is probably the best way. Right. Yeah. I mean, you could still do that in, in like any of the hubs themselves. Like my Geo Hub is still available to the public. But then if you wanted to say uh, build your own components or contribute your own things, then you might have to like jump through hoops with the admins. And so if you don't want to do that, then you can just download the VM and that's probably your, your easiest like path of least resistance to like adding new things and testing them out. Okay, sounds great. So I'll, I'll share my, uh, one of my observations through the last five years. Um, so most research groups, um, they don't want to set up their own server hubs. They want to have a place they just go and use. So that's why we're seeing a, a great uptake on my GeoHub. We're serving uh, more than 9,000 users a year right now. Uh, it's just, I, I, I guess, yeah, it's, uh, it's available there for people to set up, but my observation has been a lot of research groups, they just want something that, a gateway that's there, they, they can just jump in and use. So Jack and the Marshall Group are kind of an exception rather than a rule? Right, that's why they chose me as a guinea pig. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> uh, do, uh, do you think that the one science place will be another place where we can do this sort of thing? Exactly, yeah. That, that would be, I was going to say, um, Hub, that's where Hub Zero is going, I think, that um, having a sort of uh, very similar to the way we're doing my Geo Hub, that um, it's basically uh, groups sharing the hardware. Um, and you don't, so the costing, co uh, the cost uh, of hosting is, um, would be much cheaper. And Wine Science Place also promised that you, you once you um, have your gateway hosted there, they're going to keep it alive for a certain number of years after your funding ends. So that is a, a place. Um, yeah, so we have um, Hub Zero's lead, uh, Mike Zenner on our um, geo edf team and so we're going to make sure whatever we develop um, it'll run on one science hub sounds great uh, any other questions if not uh, marissa and i'd really like to thank you all for presenting i think this has been a really good uh, eye-opener for our uh, community and i think uh, most everybody on here was specifically you know, focused on uh, cyber GIS and geosciences and things. So uh, we, we, uh, we think you'll probably hear a lot of questions uh, after this presentation, especially when we uh, post it on the YouTube channel. So uh, with any closing comments or anything, and, and if not, we'll uh, let everybody head for the coffee break. 
Yeah. Thank, right, you. thank you. So much. Thanks, folks. I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna start recording now. Yep. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much.